Welcome to Eustick Road Church of the Nazarene in Caldwell, Idaho. This is the Sunday morning service. And now your speaker, Senior Pastor Brian Dyer. Mark chapter 11. And we're going to be reading the first 11 verses. Probably not a surprise to you where I'm at today. I mean, really, you know, Palm Sunday, wonder what he's going to read today. You know, it's always kind of a shocker. It's like reading out of Luke chapter 2 at Christmas. Oh, how did that happen? <laughs> let's, let's go, fellas. Starting at verse 1. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, <clears throat> saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. You know, sometimes I think that Jesus does these miracles just to be showing off. I mean, you know, he's going in with his, his disciples, and he says, listen, I want you to go ahead of me, and you're going to find a colt there that's never been ridden, and I want you to bring it back here. And then the disciples, I mean, I mean realistically, the disciples probably went, Wow, how did he know that? I mean, wouldn't, you, wouldn't that be your instinctive reaction? Sometimes I think, now he's got a purpose, and he's showing his divinity, he's showing him who he is, but it's sometimes you just go, you know, wow. I mean, just the miracles that, that you miss. I mean, you know, the things that we overlook, you don't even think about. Jesus knew it. He, he foreknew where this was going to be at. Right there's a miracle. I mean, if, if somebody else did that, if you were, if, 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 you know, if I was hanging out with Brian Sluter and he was telling, he would, he could tell me something down the future, I'd go, wow, I'd really be surprised. I mean, but the disciples are actually really used to this. Jesus does so many miracles all the time. As a matter of fact, John says it, in the book of John, he says, you know, he did so many miracles. I, I didn't even bother trying to write them all down. I couldn't record them all. I just gave you a few of them so that you would have faith. But they were like in abundance. It's something when, you, when, when Christ is operating in the spirit, he's got this stuff going on around him all the time. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say the Lord needs it. And we'll send it back here shortly. You'll get the animal back. Don't get all excited. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? You think they were shocked? I mean, they'd already been told, if anybody asks, yeah. They answered as Jesus had told them, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Father, I thank you for your word, and I praise you, dear God, for the message that you have for our hearts today. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to be yielded, that we might hear through the presence and the power of your Holy Spirit, dear God, the message that you have for each one of us. Lord, not my will, dear God, not my words be spoken, but yours. I pray that you would hide the speaker behind the cross, dear Lord, and that we would, each one, Father, be able to to listen and have ears to hear what your spirit says to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. I, I looked at this and being, uh, you know, Passion Week, I, I, I thought that this is the last week of Jesus' life here on earth. And, I, and I, I put that down on my Facebook. Some of you noticed it. I asked, if this was your last week to live and you knew it, what would you do? I, so I Googled it first to find out. That's what you do. You Google it. And I Googled it to find out how many other surveys have been there. And I said, to find out what people would say, you know, what they would do. And a lot of folks, not you guys, you guys were godly, but uh, is, uh, a lot of people would indulge themselves in any kind of a carnal fashion as possible. You know, and then some people said, you know, a lot of folks most probably said, you know, I would want to spend all that time with my family because that's really important. It's an interesting thing how when you ask somebody, you know, what would you do if this was your last week? John Wesley was once asked, um, what would you do if you knew you were going to die tomorrow? And he said, well, I would 
go to bed. I would get up, and he was he kept insane hours. He got up, Billy got up like you. He got up like at four in the morning, you know. Um, and so he said, I would, uh, I would, I would, I would get up and I would go to my five preaching points. He had five places he was going to be preaching at the next day. He said, I would go and I would declare the mercies of Jesus Christ, and then I would lay down at night and go to be with my Savior, you know. And I thought, what an awesome answer. You know, it's an interesting thing how sometimes you have to ponder stuff in such an extreme fashion before we actually do what we should be doing each and every single day of our lives anyway. You know, what would you do if you're going to die next week? Well, truthfully, you should be doing the very same thing anyway. Whatever you were going to do next week if you were going to die, do that now, would you? You know, I mean, with the exception of go to your job, you know, pay your bills. You know, I mean, you know, there would be a few things I might cut out differently, you know, but... Uh, but with those exceptions, that should be our lifestyle. We should be living in such a fashion that we don't have a bunch of regrets. We don't have a bunch of remorses. We don't have a lot of problems going on. Jesus is walking into um, the last week of his life, and he struggled with it too. He prays in the garden. He says, Lord, if it's possible, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from before me. But even so, not my will, but thy will be done. You see, the problem is the flesh dies hard. We, we're, we're, we're kind of an animal, this part of us here, the flesh part, it fights for life. It's a natural tendency. Actually, our souls do too, but they, it fights for eternal life, just a different kind of life. But the flesh, it wants to live. And even after you become a Christian, the flesh wants to live, and maybe even so more so then. So Christ is looking at the last week of his life, and he prioritizes. Here he comes into... Uh, He's coming into the city. Jesus goes into the city. First he goes and he gets this, this colt. Now, when I first read that, he's going to get this colt that hasn't been, that's never been ridden. And in, in, in some, some of them say it's a donkey. And in Zechariah. And I thought, the first thing I thought, what's the first thing you think? When, you, when he says, you know, you're going to ride it, this animal that's never been ridden. First thing I thought was, poor little colt. I mean... I mean, poor little, why didn't he go get a big one? Go and get this poor little animal that's never been ridden. What a mean thing to do. You know, I'm picturing like, you know, this little tiny newborn colt. You know what I mean? And then I, and then I stopped and I thought, okay, wait a minute, he didn't do that. He rode this animal that was a little bigger. Then I, then I understood the miracle of it. You know, at first I went, you know, what a bully. You know, protecting the little colt. Then I went, wait a minute, this is a colt that's never been ridden. This is an animal that's not used to being ridden, and he decides to sit on it for the very first time. That's not going to go well. You know, this, is, this could be a really catastrophic entry into the city. You know, I mean, Jesus hanging on to it, being drugged behind the animal. You know, it could have really been gone bad if it had been anything. You see, you see how the miracles were just all over the place? They were too abundant to even recognize them all. That's kind of the way you go through your day, isn't it? blessed by God, and you don't even see all the blessings because they're all over the place all the time. And because life is so riddled with them, we take it all for granted. We have so many blessings, so many wonderful things have happened in our lives that we can't even recognize them sometimes. So Christ rides on this, on this donkey, which, you know, the colt, if it's a donkey, which it's, it's, it's supposed to be, a donkey is, is a peculiar animal. There were kings, there were judges back in the Old Testament that rode donkeys. But let's say you were going to war, okay, and you had to pick the animal you were going to ride into war. You're, and, and, you know, these guys here, I mean, realistically, in Judges, they didn't even have metal swords yet. I mean, so you got a stick with, with a rock on the end, and you're going to go do battle. Now, what animal are you going to, what animal are you going to ride? Tell me what animal you want to ride. Clydesdale. A Clydesdale? <laughs> An elephant? A war horse? A bear? <laughs> bear could be good. Anybody want to ride a donkey? I mean, really, you think about it, he's not the animal, a beast of burden on purpose. He's not the guy that you want to be riding on if you go into war. You're going in there, and the other guy's riding this big war horse, and you're on a little tiny donkey. It's going to be a long day. So when he's riding it in, he's riding this, this, this colt in. He's, he's, he's coming in a certain fashion. Listen to what they sing out. Ready? Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom 
of our father David. Did you catch that? The, the blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Think about this contrast for just a minute. What did the Jews expect? They were expecting a Messiah. What kind of Messiah? They were looking for the kingdom to be restored to the same glory as David. Right now, they were oppressed by the Romans. They were, they were like the, 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 the servants, the slaves. They were, they were underneath the Romans. And they're thinking, when the Messiah gets here, he's going to come. And, and we are gonna, we're going to stomp on these Romans. We're going to subdue them. And we are going to conquer the land once again. We will have it, and it will be the kingdom of our father David. Here comes Jesus riding on a donkey, a little baby one. And you go, dude, you, you, you don't get this whole kingdom thing very well, do ya? He's, he's, not, he's, not, he's not ushering in what, what they're expecting even then. Jesus has been with them all this time. They've seen the miracles. They've seen his humility. They've seen it all. And yet they're still saying, we're going to be the conquerors. His, his entry fulfilled the prophecy of Zechariah, but I don't think that it did everything that the crowds wanted. Notwithstanding, they were compelled to recognize him. And they start, they know who he is. I, 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 always, I always struggle with the fact that we hear miracles. Like, I think of the woman taken in adultery, or, or the woman who had the blood issuance for, for 38 years. I don't think those people disappeared, you know? I mean, we don't know what happened with them. We don't know who they were and all those kind of things. But I think if you were healed by Jesus, if you were a blind man and all of a sudden you could see, I think I would hang out with him for a while. I do. I think, I think Jesus probably had a whole lot of people that are not recorded in the scriptures that were just as much his disciples that were just more grateful and were like always there. It's like, dude, he's always here, Jesus. He follows us around. Ever since you gave him his eyesight, he won't go home. Go home. <laughs> you know? Those guys were there in the crowd. And when they came in and Jesus comes in, I'm sure that their hearts rejoiced. And they said, this is him. And, and for the first time in his ministry, Jesus is recognized by the whole throng as everybody as being the Messiah. Up until this point, he's had individual professions. But now, the whole group, everybody... And I'm sure that these guys are, are, just, uh, the, are, just, are just praising his name and rejoicing and, and seeing what's going on. And they're excited. They're excited. I mean, you know, could you imagine for the first time being able to, that, that you're seeing, you've been healed, and now everybody is recognizing him. Before you did, before you praised him, but nobody else did. You were alone in your praise of the Lord. You were alone in your service to God. But whether you're alone or not, you're still praising him. You're still excited about it. But the culture around you is not really conducive to it. Do you follow that? All the people around you are not praising God. All the people around you are resistant to recognizing Jesus Christ. The world doesn't really want a Messiah if it has demands upon him. The world wants to deny the existence of God, not because they have a better explanation, but because they don't like humility. Do you follow that? If God exists, if God created the world, if everything is contingent upon him and he says don't steal, then you're not allowed to steal. If he says you're supposed to be honest, trustworthy, love your neighbor, and you yield to God, then you have to do those things. But if you can deny God, then you, you don't have to do those. Because you say, God doesn't exist, I get to do whatever I want to. So if you don't acknowledge him and you don't give him his lordship, then you still get to be king of the hill. You get to call your own shots. For those people who are already praising God, this is like, this is glorious because they look, they go, look, everybody's with us. Right now, the whole world is on board with what we're doing. They haven't been, and they won't be for very long. You know, guys, this is us. Man, I see us all over this story. You know, you're called into a hostile environment. Most of the time, the world around you doesn't recognize your Christ, and you're, you're, you're kind of a goofball at work. People, people at work, they, they would think you silly if you tell them, listen, I follow Jesus Christ, and I love the Lord. I hope, you're, I hope, I hope it doesn't intimidate you. I hope, I hope the world just thinks you're as goofy as can be. That's what I hope. I hope that you can pronounce your faith in Jesus Christ without any reservations. Whether the world is on board or whether they're not, 
We're still, we're, still the, we're still the faithful ones who declare the name of our Heavenly Father. We recognize and give Him the glory. For once, the crowd recognizes Messiah. But within a week, within a week, all of those chants will change. You see, because while the whole crowd's out there, there's some leaders sitting back in the, in the corners and they're watching. And they say, you, you remember when he raised Lazarus from the dead and we thought we had a problem? We're going to have to do something about this. We're going to have to put an end to this. And so they begin their plot. They begin, to, they begin their plot to eliminate Jesus Christ and the threat that he is. For us, we've got more than one day. We've got more than one reaction. Our goal is not to recognize Jesus at one opportunity, not at one given location, not, not at church on Sunday. At church on Sunday, you, you're welcome to. But not only at church on Sunday. Church at Sunday, that's our, that's our Palm Sunday. Every Sunday, we come to Palm Sunday. Every Sunday, we walk into a place where the crowd cries out, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. But on Monday through Saturday, we have a different week. You're in a different environment. Our goal is to love Jesus Christ and declare his glory every day, every day, independent of what anybody else is going to do. You be an independent thinker. You be somebody who thinks for yourself, not somebody who has to follow the masses. Our recognition of Christ is something that we have to do on a day-to-day -day basis. We have to recognize him in all that we do. We have to give him the glory all the time. It's who we are. It's who we're called to be. I have a wonderful st song for, uh, the, uh, for Easter. I'm not singing it. But uh, I, I, looking, at, looking at what we're walking into, I wanted to, I wanted to close with this song because I just think it's, it's one of my favorite Veggie Tales songs. So um, we're, I, got a, I got an Easter song for you. Somebody better come to sing it. It was really hard for me to find an instrumental, like it was actually impossible. And it decided that it didn't want to be turned into one either. So I'm going to be doing this a cappella. But if you would like to listen to it and watch the scene that goes with, I would really encourage you to. It's called Hope Song, and it's from the Veggie Tales and Easter Carol, I think, actually, I think I tapped the wrong thing, but um, it's really, it's actually an incredibly beautiful, th an incredibly beautiful scene, so. There's a story that started on Christmas when a baby was born in the night and those who came far who followed the star were singing a heavenly sight. A heavenly sight. Well, the years hurried by, and the boy, now a man, could make the blind see with the touch of his hand. He was born to be king, he was rabbi and priest. The best that he had, he gave to the least. He gave to the least. He was born and he died almost 2,000 years ago. He laughed and he cried. He felt all the fears we know. But what does it matter? A story so strange. Even if it is true, what does it change? What does it change? Well, he spoke like a prophet, like no one they'd heard. A simple young carpenter, crowds hung on every word. He hated injustice, he taught what is right. He said, I'm the way and the truth and the light. Well, his friends soon believed that truly he was the one, the Savior, Messiah. God's one and only son, but others, they doubted, they did not agree. So they took him, they tried him, he died on a tree. He died on a tree. Well, where's the hope in that? If that was the end of the story, there would be no hope. But it isn't. God. 
has made a way for all who would and grieve. Death will never be the end if you just believe. There is nothing left to fear. Nothing heaven knows, for he died for us to give us life and to give us hope he rose. He died for us to give us life and to give us hope he rose. Praise the Lord. Let's close in a word of prayer. <coughs> Father, today we join our voices with the crowd in singing Hosanna, Hosanna. And Lord, I pray, dear God, that you would give us strength and courage, that we would be the hope, Lord, that we would be the light, Father, or that we would reflect the light to the world that they so desperately need. I pray, dear God, that new souls would be won into the kingdom. Lord, that, that, that we would be able to tell people the good news of our risen Messiah. And I pray today, dear God, that you would help us, Lord, to die out to ourselves, to put to death the misdeeds of the flesh and those things that would distract us, and that truly we'd be able to live for the King. Thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, my friends. You're dismissed. Shake hands and be friendly. <laughs>